afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming, and thanks for actually inviting me to speak to you about uh, a topic that is very near and dear to me, which is civil rights. Uh, I won't interfere with your, your lunch, but uh, uh, let me just start by saying my interest in civil rights started from my, uh, from my dad. Uh, because as some of you might know, during World War II, amidst, amidst the hysteria surrounding uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese, thousands of Japanese Americans were rounded up and put into concentration camps. My father and mother were one. My mother actually, it was kind of funny because they, they divided the uh, area in Washington between different zones. And if you were in zone one, you had to go to the concentration camp. My mom actually ended up just moving across just east of the Cascades to Spokane, and she, she didn't have to go. But my father and his family were, were rounded up, and uh, it was something that made a permanent impression on him. And he used to tell me uh, that my grandmother, who's Issei, which is a first generation uh, Japanese who immigrated to this country, used to tell him, this will be a black tie to this country. And I think that's true, because what happened to them is they lost all civil rights. They weren't given lawyers. There was no trial. There was no any proof that there was any espionage or terrorism. They were simply put in the camps where they stayed there for varying amounts of time from anywhere from one to two, three years. Um, and he used to always talk to me about how unfair that was. And he was very proud of the fact that uh, people of his generation went out, and they didn't protest, they didn't fight, they went out and proved their loyalty. But it always struck me as something, that, that seems very unfair to have to do, to prove your loyalty when you're an American citizen, when you've done nothing wrong. And so from that, I've always had a very deep and sensitive uh, appreciation for our civil rights. And if you think about our civil rights, this country was actually founded on civil rights. Um, the first immigrants, not the first residents, the first residents were the Native Americans, but the first immigrants were pilgrims that came here from England to escape religious persecution. And it was with that mindset that our Constitution was established. It afforded certain rights to all of our citizens. And I think that uh, the one point I wanted to make is that if we don't protect our civil rights, if we don't enforce them, then what good is our freedom? What good is all the privileges that we have here? And the one thing that uh, I, I worry about is I see strange parallels between what happened to my parents and what has happened in the fallout of the September 11th to the Arab Muslim Sea uh, and East African community. And so I think it's timely that we talk about civil rights, the importance of them, and the need to continually enforce them and protect them. So what I wanted to do today is talk about the civil rights program that my office has. And we have both, uh, we criminally prosecute cases, and we also enforce laws on our civil side through lawsuits. So on the criminal side, there are basically three areas that we practice in. The first one being color of law, and that's uh, law enforcement misconduct. And I think Officer Diaz mentioned that, uh, made mention of an example where an, where an officer acting under using their office uh, engages in actions that violate other people's civil rights. And that would be a case that would fall under uh, color of law. Human trafficking falls into two areas, both not only labor, where people are brought into this country and basically made either indentured servants or made to work for uh, less than what would be normal uh, uh, wages or no wages at all, and sex trafficking. And that's an area that uh, I've, I've been fairly active in. I've worked very closely with the FBI on their Innocence Loss task, task Force, and we've seen really a rise amongst um, 
some of the street gang members who have looked to traffic minor, uh, minors, young women, out on the streets as a form of making money. The other area is hate crimes, and that's, that's an area that, the first area that I'd like to talk to, and I'm gonna end with the civil enforcement of our office. Now, hate crimes, are a very important part of what we do. As uh, Martin Luther King said, hate multiplies hate and violence multiplies violence. And I'd like to think that as part of our prosecution of hate crimes, we can stem the spread of this type of violence and the spread of this type of fear and hate that occur in these crimes. And hate crimes are, are, are unique in the sense that they don't affect just the person that gets attacked. They, they affect the entire community. So when you hear that, say for example, a Muslim person is attacked, a call the terrorists and told to go back to their country, it doesn't just affect that, that person. Every Muslim that hears about that feels their sense of security shaken to its core. Or if a cross is planted and burned on the front of an African American, it's not just arson, and it's not just the people that live in that home that, that are affected by it, but it's the entire community, and it brings up all the feelings of fear that African Americans have, have felt through all the years. Or a gay person leaving a bar gets jumped by some bullies and beaten up because of their sexual orientation. It's not just him who got beat up, but it's the entire community that fears. And so, these are very important crimes, and, and we handle them very spe uh, specially. Now, what is a hate crime? A hate crime is defined more by its motivation, and it's when somebody commits an act of violence against you because of who and what or what you are. What type of crimes do we, uh, do we see and do we investigate and prosecute? Well, they, they span the spectrum. The uh, threats from email or uh, harassing telephone calls to vandalism of a person's house where uh, racist graffiti is sprayed on the house. It can be arson in the form of either the house being firebombed burning process being planted in front of it, as well as as extreme as murder. And the, as I said, the key to these crimes is what was the motivation. <clears throat> now, there are a variety of laws that we uh, operate under when we get a referral for, for, a, for a hate crime. And they're listed here. The top one is what is now are general federal hate crimes, and it's called the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Act. Uh, and it, it actually, historically, uh, before we would use what I'll refer to as Section 235, <coughs> interference with federally protected rights. But in 2009, towards the end of 2009, uh, Congress passed the Byrd Shepard Act. And what that allowed us to do, it gave us jurisdiction to go after all racially motivated crimes that uh, involve violence. And so when we get a, uh, a crime, we look to see, well, what happened? And we'll use one of these particular uh, statutes here to charge. If it is violence against a person because of race, we'll, we'll use the uh, uh, Matthew Shepard James Byrd Act. If a person is uh, attacked because they're voting or because they are in, say, a, a restaurant or bar, we'll look to interference with a federal right. Or if there is some violence surrounding a person buying or selling a house, we'll charge them with interference with housing. Now, lastly, if there are more than two people that are involved, we can charge a conspiracy. And that's just where, uh, as I said, more than one person's involved and they act in concert together. So, I wanted, uh, because I'm going to cover a lot of ground, 
I'm just going to speak very generally, and if you have questions, I'm happy to ask, uh, ask, answer them uh, and give you more detail. But I'm just going to cover what some are the basic things that we have to prove. For a, uh, our general uh, hate crime, we have to prove that a person intentionally caused or attempted to cause bodily injury. Now, if it's an attempt, we have to show that a weapon was used. And we also have to show that it was because of race. Now, how do we prove that? One of the main pieces of evidence that we look to are, it's what was said during the attack. Were there, were there racial slurs yelled? Were there um, were other people around saying things? So we have to look at the circumstances, but what a person says can be uh, our best evidence. The other thing we look to is the background of the attacker. Does that attacker have uh, a background with a racist group? And if they do, that's additional evidence of what was going on in their mind. Now, not, a lot of times we're not always lucky to have them yelling uh, the word nigger if they're attacking somebody or the word jack. Uh, so we have to dig even further than that. But that is something that we have to prove. And sometimes it gets a little difficult because if the victim and the attacker know each other, many times there might be a personal element to it as well. Simply having more than one reason to attack someone doesn't prevent us from going forward, however. Now, part of uh, the James Byrd Shepherd Act, one of the major changes in the law was it expanded the protected classes to people's uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender or disability. But in those type of cases, not only do we have to approve the motivation was because a person, I'll say for example, was gay, we also have to prove that it affected interstate commerce. And for anyone who constitutional buffs, the reason why that is, was under um, the racial portion of the law was passed under the 13th Amendment, which outlawed slavery and what have you. This was passed under the Commerce Clause. So we have to show some uh, that this attack had some impact on interstate commerce. And so how do we show that? Well, we can show that if the weapon that was used was manufactured outside the state of Washington and therefore had to have traveled uh, across state lines, uh, whether the victim was lured across state lines or traveled across state lines in order for the attack to happen, likewise with the attacker, or if the crime itself had some impact on a business. If, a, if an attack took place in a bar and they had to shut the bar down and therefore the bar lost business, that would also be a way of showing interstate commerce. The other area is interference with a federal right. And again, we have to show willfully, but basically that's intentionally use force or threat of force because of who or what the victim was, race, color, religion. And then we have an added element that we have to show. Not only that it was racially motivated, but because the person was engaging in a federally protected right. So say, for example, a um, Asian person is trying to enroll in a school, but they're attacked. That, then we would have not only the use of force, uh, the protected class, but we'd also have the dual motive as well. So what type of activities do we look to? Education, employment. I don't have up there voting, but voting. And one of the largest or uh, most frequent ones we see is public accommodation. That is where people uh, are attacked that are using a restaurant or place of entertainment. Uh, and historically, the reason why this law is structured the way it is is because it was passed during the mid-60s during the civil rights movement when the civil rights workers and other people that were uh, attempting to expand civil rights for African-Americans were being attacked doing these very type of activities. And so Congress 
structured the law very narrowly in that regard. But before we had the, uh, the uh, James Byrd Matthew Shepherd Act, we had to try and pigeonhole what happened into one of these categories. And, and, and sometimes it resulted in us not being able to prosecute. Uh, we had a case where uh, a person, uh, African American, was a, ho a homeless man who was walking on the street. A car of uh, white skinheads drove by, drove back. One of the guys jumped out and then ended up trying to stab him. Fortunately, it was wintertime and he had thick clothing on and he wasn't injured. We looked at that case, and this was before the uh, Bird Shepherd Act was passed, to see whether or not we could prosecute that. And ultimately, we concluded we couldn't because what uh, federal protected activity was he involved in? We thought of uh, under public accommodation or a state uh, facility, maybe a street, using a street as a state uh, facility, but ultimately we decided not to. And uh, I, I believe that the case was handled by the state. Again, just some examples of what a public facility is, a public park, public accommodation, place of uh, entertainment. Now, recently we prosecuted a case uh, against a guy who uh, he and two of his friends had gone in a bar and attacked the only African American in the bar. And that person's name was Zachary Beck. We charged them with conspiracy because there was two or more people that agreed to do this. And we also charged them with interference with a protected right. So not only were we able to show that it was racially motivated, but we were also showed that it was interfering with his right to public accommodation, which was to be in the bar. Now, the witness tampering was because after this fight, he ran to his girlfriend's house and told her, look, whatever happened, I was here all night. And then just kind of as a funny side note, he then called 911 and said, hey, I heard there's some guys, uh, well, my friends were telling me that someone that looks like me was down at a bar and got in a fight. Well, ended up not being true. And just, I'll go through this. This is where it happened. It was in Vancouver, Washington, at the Captain's Sports Bar. The victim was standing here with a small group of his friends, about four or five people, and Mr. Beck was sitting here. And what he did is he summons the bartender over and he said, hey, tell your friends they better leave, because it's going to be trouble. The bartender went and told uh, the victim and his friends what Mr. Beck said. They just kind of ignored him. Beck called the bartender over again and said, hey, I told you, these guys better leave. There's some mean people on the way. There's going to be trouble. Bartender at that point told them, hey, well, maybe you need to leave the bar. We don't want any trouble here. And in fact, Mr. Beck did leave the bar. He went out to the front and stood right around here where he was met by two other of his associates, Corey Boyd and Lawrence Silk, both well-known members of one of the local skinhead groups. And a couple of other people walked up, and we learned from them that Beck was talking to these two men. He was referring to the, the victim as, as a nigger and that he shouldn't be in there kissing our women um, and that something needed to be done. He even tried to recruit the other people uh, by keep offering them $100 if they would go in and hit, quote, unquote, the, uh, the nigger. Uh, they then went in. Mr. Beck walked up to the victim, leaned into him, and said, hey, I told you you shouldn't be here. The victim was kind of dumbfounded and said, well, I don't even know you. I mean, uh, do, do we have a problem? I'm sorry. Mr. Beck turned his back and said, you shouldn't be kissing a woman. And then he took a haymaker of a swing. Uh, fortunately, the victim was an athlete. He had very quick reactions. He ducked. He was able to get Beck in a, in a chokehold, at which point the two other men jumped in on him. And they were, while they were trying to get to him, and and the victim was using him as a, as a shield. The two others, Boyd and Silk, were yelling, white power, you know, we're going to F and kill that, you know, racial slur. So that went on for a while. Unfortunately, the, the, the fight was broken up. These men fled. Mr. Silk was arrested by the state. He was prosecuted uh, locally for malicious harassment. He got 24 months. 
So we charged Beck and Boyd, and Mr. Boyd pled guilty, got 34 months. We went to trial on Mr. Beck, and he ended up getting 51 months. Now, as I said, we had to prove that this was racially motivated. In this case, because of the words that were yelled by Boyd and Silk, that was helpful. But as we dug into Mr. Beck's background, we found that he had a long history in the white supremacist movement. In fact, he had moved to Idaho to live with this man, who was the founder of the Aryan Nation. And as you can see here, all the regalia surrounding that, including the red shoelaces. Now, the red shoelaces is significant because it's well known that the skinheads, you have to earn those by shedding blood for the movement. So that kind of gave us some evidence of his racial thinking. The other thing is, and it may not have shown here too well, this is the Aryan Nation shield. And the numbers 14 and 88 have specific meanings to the Aryan Nation. I can't tell you exactly what they were. 14 words of David Lane and the 88 precepts, I can't remember what that is. But again, evidence of his racial beliefs. And under here, it doesn't show up too well, white power. So that was some evidence that we were able to introduce that trial to convince. In this case, he smartly waived right to a jury. We were able to convince the judge that Mr. Beck was a racist and this was racially motivated. One of his defenses at trial, ironically, was that he was at the bar because he was working for the FBI. And he was trying to gather information on the white supremacists. So he was meeting these guys there to just gather intelligence. Well, in fact, he had met the FBI before he got out of prison a couple months earlier, but they never had any agreement. So he tried to use that. And then he also said, well, and I swung at the guy because it was in self-defense. He got in my face and I needed to defend myself. But I didn't try and hit him. So as I described the wild punch, he said, look, I threw that wild punch. I closed my eyes and was hoping that it would miss because I didn't want to look like a weenie, if you will, in front of the two other guys. Well, obviously, it didn't work. As I said, he was convicted and he received 51 months. His partner also had tattoos as well, a big German swastika on his stomach. And we had a witness who showed up at the bar right around the same time. And that witness testified that when he walked up and approached the three men, when he went to shake their hands, instead of shaking their hands, the guy went, I'll hit him. And another good piece of evidence. And also on his hands, he had drawn the swastika. It's almost like war paint in red ink. And so while this crime turned out not to be too horrific for a victim, we were lucky, actually, that the victim wasn't hurt. It was one of the cases that I'd have to say was the strongest evidence of just something that was purely racial. And it was a reminder that there are people out there that will attack someone, not because they have personal reasons, but because of who they are. Now, interference with housing. And generally, that is when there is violence against people who are occupying a house, selling a house. And where we see that most of the time is we've had situations where either the only racial minority living in a neighborhood is attacked, their house is vandalized in some form or fashion, or you have a mixed race couple that is living there. And again, their house is vandalized. So we will investigate those type of crimes under this law here, interference with housing. And what we have to show there, again, is that there was some violence involved, that it was done to injure the people occupying the house or to intimidate them. So it's a little broader in terms of what we have to prove. But we also have to show that it was racially motivated or motivated because a person's ethnicity or national origin, religion, and that it's interfering with their housing rights. And again, most frequently, 
we see it in um, the situation where it's somebody who's just living here. They don't like the fact that they now have people of that color living in the neighborhood. Um, but it could also include if somebody is selling a house, say to a, a, a racial minority. And so you could be white, and if you're selling your house to uh, a racial minority and someone uh, attacks you or vandalizes your home, we could prosecute under this law as well. The victims, in other words, do not have to be of that uh, protected class, if you will. So it's a pretty broad law. Again, just dual motives, not only racial, but also interference with the housing rights. Just some examples of the type of things that we've seen. And about six years ago, we had a case here in, uh, in Washington. It was actually up in Edmonds. It was Iraq, an Iranian family woke up to find a burning cross in front of their house. The father was a professor, I, I think it was Seattle University, and his son went to the local high school. Well, there was some conflict between the son and another group of kids there. And they got together at a person's house. They didn't live too far from this family. They built a six foot cross, doused it with gasoline, and took it down there and set it on fire in front of their house. So the, Mr. Sargent was actually, he was 18 at the time. So we, we could prosecute him as an adult. But there were a couple of his friends who were juveniles. And in the federal system, it's very difficult to prosecute juveniles, and we typically defer to the state to let them take, to let them take that. Now, I, I felt that this was a very important case for a variety of reasons. And so we opened an investigation. We ended up calling a number of the kids who were there to the grand jury to testify. And what we had learned later is, however, that they had actually got together and concocted a story to say, yeah, we were at the house, but no one left. Uh, well, when we contacted Mr. Sargent, he knew that we were looking at him and we were going to charge him. His lawyer brought him in, and he cooperated. He ended up pleading not to uh, interference of housing, but he ended up pleading to a conspiracy to violate civil rights. But he also gave us information. He told us about what actually happened and that the two people that we had called to the grand jury had actually perjured themselves. So not only did we prosecute Mr. Sargent for the civil rights violation, we were able to prosecute the two other young men who came in and perjured themselves for perjury. And the point that I wanted to make, and I, and I hope that, that we made it, was just that these were serious. And that any time you burn a cross on someone's lawn, it's never a joke. Because that's what they tried to explain. In many of these hate crimes, they often try and play it off. Well, I was just joking. I didn't really mean it. But there are certain symbols of hate that cross the line all the time. I think putting a, a swastika on a Jewish synagogue is one of them. Burning a cross is another. Conspiracy, I, I talked about that. It's just when people actually agree to, to commit the crime together. And there are certain rights that, in a conspiracy charge, that we have to prove. It has to interfere with a constitutional right or a right that is given by a federal law, such as housing, employment, uh, public accommodation, or travel. Now I want to shift gears here and talk about our color of law program. And this is another uh, area that is very important that, that we operate on. And that is actually looking at misconduct of police officers themselves. And it's difficult because we work with uh, law enforcement officers all the time, but we also realize that if the public can't trust the people that are there to police them, then really, what do we have? What type of security do we have? And so under this law, if an officer uses their position, the authority that they have as a result of their badge, to commit a crime, 
violates a person's civil rights. We will look at that under Section 242. And typically where we see this is you hear it in terms of excessive force during arrest. Uh, we had cases where there have been allegations of sexual misconduct. We even had cases where uh, an officer is engaged in stealing things and profiting from it. So we investigate any law enforcement officer, but that also includes public officials as well. It can include a judge, it can include a prosecutor. So what are the things that we have to prove? We have to show that uh, they use their authority of their office to further their crime. And the willfulness. I think that is really what separates um, or is an extremely high hurdle for us to meet. Because not only do we have to show that the officer acted intentionally, what we have to show is that they knew what they were doing was wrong, but they went and had it and did it anyway. So if you have an excessive force case, say uh, a, a person is stopped, and they're not, they're not uh, giving you any flack, they're not resisting, and the officer just pulls out their taser and just tases them. The officer knows, I don't need to use that force, but they do it anyway. Then that would be the will. The other thing is it has to be tied to a constitutional right, such as uh, the Fourth Amendment, which is the right to be free from unlawful searches and seizures. And I said, as I said, these are some of the things that we see. Now, deprivation of medical attention is a situation where someone is in obvious need of medical attention and the officers do not seek it for them, really for the purpose of, of, of making them suffer. Deprivation of property, that's a case where if an officer steals uh, items, and we've had cases where officers have uh, set up drug dealers, they've stole the drugs and then sold them and profited from, from them themselves. Presentation of false evidence, that could be in lying in an affidavit to get a search warrant, or testifying uh, falsely at trial, or even manufacturing evidence to convict somebody. Or a pattern of just stopping somebody when they have no grounds to do it. These are just a couple of examples that the Department of Justice has been involved in. Um, there was a Jackson, Mississippi officer that arrested a 19-year-old, took her out to the woods and raped her. Uh, that would be a violation of her Fourth Amendment as well as due process rights. And then uh, we, all, we also see it in terms of uh, jails or prisons. In this case, in Marlowe, the jail sergeant uh, assaulted people that were at, inmates at the jail and, in fact, beat one uh, inmate so bad and denied the medical attention that this inmate died. Now, Mr. Marlow is now serving a life sentence as a result of that. <coughs> then lastly, uh, Palomares, that was a Los Angeles police detective who, uh, along with other officers, was committing a series of home invasion into drug dealers so that they could get their drugs. Human trafficking and forced labor. Now, under the 13th Amendment, slavery was outlawed on, the, on a constitutional level. And yet, we still see it in our society. Excuse me. Not in the same ways that we saw it back when, prior to the Civil War, but we see it in terms of labor. And typically where we see it happening is in immigrant communities where people are brought here under uh, certain pretenses that, oh, if you come, I can help you get education or I can get you a good job. And when they get here, things are changed. And either they're told, well, now you owe me you know, $10,000 for uh, coming here and you have to work for free or you have to work to pay back that. But by the way, you owe us room and board. And so they continue to work and they never get out. Or they're just brought, we, we've also seen it in um, brothel cases, where women are brought from a foreign country here under the guise that they're going to get a legitimate job, and they end up being forced to work in 
these massage parlors, which are fronts for basically prostitution. We've also had it where illegal immigrants are brought up from south of the border here and basically made to, to work for free. They're put into a, into a house, they're, they're pretty much isolated and locked in, and they're made to work repeatedly. Now, one of the threats that a lot of these uh, traffickers will do is they'll take advantage of people who are less educated, and they will also scare them because they, they'll tell them, look, we know where your family lives back in the home country, and if you don't do this, something's going to happen. And so we see that happening quite frequently. This just defines what, what human trafficking in the labor side is, just forcing someone to work against their will. Some of the ways that uh, it, we've seen that they compel people to do it. And, and one of the main uh, ways is by isolating the victim. Many times the victim doesn't speak good English, they don't know their rights, and so they isolate them. They don't let them have friends, they don't let them socialize, they have to go and come to work. And they threaten them, they use psychological abuse, and, and many times the victim themselves will feel somewhat obligated to, to the uh, trafficker. But what makes these difficult is that it's hard to uh, know who the victims are. Because most of the time that, that we, uh, how we learn about these are from tips from other people, not the victim themselves. Just some of the laws uh, that we uh, prosecute trafficking under. And this one, 1591, sex trafficking, that force fraud and coercion, that's the one that we use the most for the prosecution of, of the pimps of underage girls. And as I said, we've seen a lot of that recently. Uh, not always, but sometimes they're street gang members. And the way that we actually learn about that is we will do stings. We'll get onto, uh, you've heard of Craigslist, or have any of you heard of Backpage? Backpage is a common uh, internet advertising, uh, advertising page where people will list their services. And if you haven't gotten on them, I, I, and you're interested, get on it. You'll be surprised at what you see. It is so obvious, sexually related. And um, so what they'll do is they'll call uh, some of these uh, uh, advertisements, and then they'll make an appointment with the, with the prostitute. And when the prostitute comes, many times they're obviously a juvenile, they'll arrest them. And what we try and do is work up the chain to find out, who are you working with? But unfortunately, one of the challenges there is many of the girls that get involved in this come from extremely troubled backgrounds. And, some, and their definition of love and support is highly uh, twisted. I mean, they, they, um, they feel very loyal to the pimp, so they won't always talk to us. So there, that's a barrier that we initially have to break into. I think the youngest girl that I've seen um, uh, being trafficked was 12 years old. And many of them, I, although I've heard of others who have said that they started when they were 11 or 12 years old, by the time we get to them, they're a little bit older. But it's, it's a very difficult, they're very challenging cases, and it requires a lot of time in building the trust of the victims. Just some of the challenges. Now, the last area I wanted to talk about was our, our civil side of the house. And there are basically three areas that we handle, and that's uh, housing, discrimination in housing, employment, and education. And what we do there is, again, these are not criminal cases, but they're uh, lawsuits that we'll bring to enforce compliance in these areas. Under housing, we uh, enforce the Fair Housing Act, also the Equal Credit, and basically that's discrimination in either housing or attempting to get loans. And then religious land use as well. In fact, uh, I, I just saw a press release from the Civil Rights Division and Department of Justice that they just settled with uh, a local government that had tried to block the building of a mosque by enacting certain 
uh, land regulations. Um, and and, and I, it's interesting because I was watching TV last week and they had a show, I think it was called uh, Enemy Next Door or what have you, and it took place in the South and it was how a city following 9-11 had kind of retaliated against the, the Muslim community here. Um, th many of these uh, Muslims had been there for years. And before that, they hadn't had any problems. Then after 9-11, things started to change. They, uh, they, they, you know, they were in a very small building. They uh, raised money. They bought a large plot of land, and they were going to build a mosque and people brought suit to, pre to prevent them, and it just split the, the small community there. Uh, that would be a situation that we would get involved in uh, as a, from a, a civil point of view, that we would sue on behalf of the victims there to ensure that the land use laws were not being discriminatory. Employment. Now, the thing here is we can't sue under this law. We can't sue private employers, but we can sue federal, state, or local employers based upon, again, discrimination. And there was a recent, um, there was a recent case that was settled where we su sued, I can't remember the state and I apologize for that, but uh, a, a local agency that was harassing an individual based upon the three. And education. Uh, often uh, we've heard a lot about bullying in schools. Now, from a criminal point of view, we, can't, we aren't able to prosecute those cases unless they rise to a certain level uh, as a crime. But where we can get involved is if the bullying uh, focuses them in on a particular group because of their race, color, or religion, and it's pervasive. And the school district knows about this but does nothing. And at that point, then we, what happens is we end up Sue, uh, suing the school district for the lack of action or certain action that they've taken that have been discriminatory. So those are the areas. Um, and I, I just end by saying that what I started with, that if you know our laws, our civil rights laws can't make us love one another, but they can make sure that we live together. They can make sure that we all have the freedom and privileges of this country. So that's what I have. And any questions? Or you're ready to get out of here to the sun? Um, is it discrimination or uh, <laughs> Yeah, that would be showing the racial motivation. Now, simply if I discriminate against you, but I don't, there's no act of violence, mm -hmm. that would be a crime that we could prosecute, if, if you could understand the distinction. Well, you are fighting the right group, but then at least it's not all about being discriminated against for what we are and what we do. Right. Our, 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 our color skin. Uh, but it does happen. It happens on a normal situation. <laughs> How can we prove it? Well, it, it can. What, from a criminal point of view, where we get involved is that there has to be violence involved. Mm -hmm. And if there's violence and, we, and there's evidence that it was, this violence was happening or they attempted to do this because of your color or your status. That, that would be a civil matter. Yeah. If you're not getting promotion, that would be a civil matter. And if that was happening from a state, federal, or local governmental agency, mm -hmm. then you could contact either the uh, Department of Labor, you could contact our office, and we would look into it, or the Civil Rights Division, and we could look into it. Now. Not every case that comes our way, we get involved in. We have to look at it to see, you know, if, if, if we can prove those, uh, prove that uh, in, in the civil context by providing. But yes, if that is happening by a, a, a government employer, then we can get involved. Uh, I have one more thing. I'm sorry. Yeah. But then we'll leave one more, another thing that I'll stop. Uh, at the mosque, there's yeah. a bunch of group of Christians. They stand right at the door of the mosque with big signs, mm -hmm. uh, trying to drive or 
gets tricky because there's we have the First Amendment. In this country, we're allowed to, as somebody earlier said, you can possess all the hate ideas you want. You could even uh, express them. Uh, in a case like that, you can be anti-Muslim. You could say, I, we don't want you guys going to the mosque. But that alone, um, standing alone, expressing that idea, <clears throat> where it doesn't substantially interfere with your right to worship, we don't get involved. Now, we, we have, there is a, 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 a federal law that, where we see it most frequently, is in the freedom of access to uh, clinic entrances, <clears throat> um, where people are protesting abortion. And if there are certain elements that are met there, then we can prosecute under that. But if there has to generally be violence involved. Um, in a case like that, <clears throat> if they are locking arms and preventing you from getting into the mosque, that is something that we could look at. And if that's happening, you should contact uh, us, and it would be the FBI that would investigate. So this, this question back to the last thing you're trying to say. OK. For me, at least, I'm speaking on my behalf. Um, white supremacists are not the ones, are not, not, not the only group I'm really concerned with. Sure. I'm concerned for the people that are really religious, that they are uncomfortable with me. And they are, they're, they're trying to do as much harm to me as possible. Uh, and uh, what can I do? I mean, to, to protect myself and my family, I might be making And I guess, it, it, you know, the difficult thing here, as, as I said, is there has to be something that crosses that line. That but if we wait for that something, I, somebody's going to get hurt, die, or you know, or it's too, too late. Well, if you if what they are doing rises to the level, I mean, really causes you sufficient concern, um, and I guess rises to the level of it being a criminal harassment. <coughs> Then we, we could investigate that. But simply a person expressing their opinion that they don't like you and they make that well known, that's, that's not going to be criminal. And, and unfortunately, that falls within the protection of, of the First Amendment. And it's a fine line. And uh, you know, I appreciate you know, your, what you're saying, because we hear about that a lot. You know, an example would be, um, we often get referrals where someone goes out and leaflets a neighborhood with white supremacist propaganda. And they leave, you know, leaflets that are denouncing whichever group they're targeting, whether it's Native Americans, Asians, African Americans. Uh, but that alone, just leafleting, or I, I, I've had a case where people receive mail anonymously from somebody. But unless there is something in that propaganda that crosses the line into a threat, where a reasonable person would feel uh, that violence was going to take place against them, we, we can't do anything about that. That is hate mail, that is hate propaganda, but it's not a hate crime. Not from a legal point. Uh, so it, it, it's a difficult balance that we have. If there are no other questions, you're excused. <laughs> Thank you very much. Earlier, I want to make sure that we, we thank our guests, our presenters, the FBI and the Seattle Police Department.